flashstore.net, the internet's number one beat marketplace. Hey everyone, I am Morsim, CEO of My Flash Store. I'm here with platinum producer DJ Payne One for an exclusive My Flash Store interview. How you doing? Great, how are you doing? Yeah, yeah, very well, thank you. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely, thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. So I just want to start off, uh, the first question is, uh, it's a question of uh, a lot of curiosity. So what does the um, one in your name, DJ Payne One, represent? That's, that's, a, <clears throat> that's a hip hop tradition, you know. Um, I was very involved in hip hop. I mean, still am, but back when I came up with my name, I was still writing graffiti and all that and, and DJing a lot more and that kind of thing. So it just, it made sense. I had a worse name initially, but it had the word pain in it. So I just decided to extract the pain from it, add the one, put the DJ in front of it and I can't really, I don't think it's a great name, but I can't really turn back from it now. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, okay, cool. So your first major placement uh, was on the track Don't Do It by Young Jeezy. So yep. how did you go about getting that first placement and how did it make you feel after landing that deal? Um, that was a matter of hard work meets luck. I had pretty much determined to either make it or quit. Not not make it in the sense of um, necessarily becoming some world famous multi millionaire producer, but just um, elevate my 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 music to a professional level. And I gave myself a year a year to do it. So in that year, I just did nothing but make beats. And and prior to that, I had a problem finishing beats. You know, I would I would start a lot of music and then just never finish it because I never felt that my beats were finished. So I made a lot of horrible music because I kind of forced myself to get into a habit of, of seeing a beat all the way to completion. But I did that for a good, I don't know, seven months into the year. And all the while was, was searching for some type of management situation or some type of shopping situation. And I found one, uh, I was actually based in, in Canada. It was a guy named Brendan who, at the time managed another producer by the name of T Williams who now goes by T minus who a lot of people are probably more than familiar with. Um, so, so I signed a, a non-exclusive management agreement with them and well him, there was only one guy. He had had some type of contact with Jeezy's engineer as he was working on the recession album. It was just the right song at the right time. And, it's kind of a non-traditional way of getting a record to an artist, not the type of, of channel that most people think of when they think of shopping a beat to an artist, but it worked. Um, how did I feel? Uh, I, I was happy, it was surreal. Um, I guess I kind of thought things were gonna be pretty straightforward from that point on and I was wrong. But it was a, it was a great feeling, so I'm, I'm grateful to Brandon, to Jeezy, to Jeezy's engineer, whose name I unfortunately don't know. I've never spoken to him, but definitely grateful to all three of them. Okay, cool. So uh, since your work uh, with Young Jeezy, you've had uh, obviously a long list of uh, impressive major placement with uh, artists like 50 Cent, Gucci Mane, Public Enemy, and more. Uh, but you say you were still frustrated at the lack of exposure you were get your work was getting. Uh, why did you think that was? And how did it make you feel about the industry? Uh, it, it's just, okay, so when I talk about the industry, I just, I mean, anybody making music in a professional capacity. So not necessarily the three or four major distributors or artists with million dollar budgets. You know, it could be the, the kid down the street who has, you know, 40,000 SoundCloud plays. <clears throat> We're all in the industry the second we start uh, making a living off of music. So, or even, even if we're, if we aspire to make a living off music and we've only started that journey, we're in the industry. So in that industry, unfortunately, producers and songwriters, um, are at the bottom of the totem pole and there's a lot of exploitation. It's not just major labels exploiting, um, their artists. It's a lot of artists exploiting each other. Uh, so, 
having seen all that and realizing that the paradigm in the music industry is that the producer is is traditionally pretty quiet and expected to um, not you know make make a fuss about uh, whether or not they receive credit or whether or not they get paid for music that was something that that bothered me obviously and so I decided to try to take things into my own hands as far as controlling my career and controlling where my music goes how it's presented how it's marketed that kind of thing and you know it's it's hard and it's a mix um, and there are some some deals with the devil that you have to make every now and then not literally but you know so it's it's an ongoing process but something that I'm I'm sticking to so, um, yeah, with so many other producers sort of getting into industry these days, so many more people getting into producing, what do you think is the best way to stay out, uh, to, to stand out in the crowd and get noticed? I think just really looking at what other people are doing and then seeing what lanes are saturated and staying out of those lanes. I mean, <clears throat> if you look at what other producers are doing and, and, and think to yourself, well, other producers are, I don't know, producing uh, beats that they consider DJ Mustard type beats and putting them on YouTube. And they're getting a lot of views, but I've never heard of this producer doing anything beyond that. Maybe you want to stay out of that lane. You know, maybe, maybe you don't want to follow that path. And, and I, it's just, I can't really tell a producer what to do as far as what their unique angle um, or approach to marketing themselves is going to be, but they know themselves better than anybody else. So they know what their strengths are. They know what their complexities as a human are. And I think they just need to play on those. I mean, for me, it was, it just kind of happened organically because I was teaching. So it made sense for my unique angle to be the kind of a, a teacher figure you know and that's where the YouTube videos came in um, and a lot of other producers aren't doing that so that was kind of a, a, a more open lane that I could occupy and grow in you know had I picked a, a lane that was already really uh, heavily trafficked then I probably wouldn't have found the amount of success I did okay so always try and find where where there's not so much competition in terms of yeah, and identify a need, you know. Your, your, your USP is and what makes you unique. Yep, yeah, yeah, USP, that's the business term, yep. <laughs> yeah, it is, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so, I mean, when I was producing back in the day, uh, I thought, like, the only way to make a living uh, from producing was to land deals with major artists or to get signed for a record label. And in my mind, it was either rich producer or poor producer. I never imagined, like, a middle ground. Um, so when I learned about selling beats online, um, I started to sell my beats to independent artists and started to build a business and career out of it. And that's why I started my flash store so I could give other producers the opportunity to build their own careers from music. So how do you think the industry has changed for producers from when you first started out in the late nineties to now? And where do you see it going? I think the producer is finally stepping, uh, beyond the curtain. Now you have, you have celebrity producers right now and you used to every now and then, but even the celebrity producers that we know of, you know, Timberland or Dr. Dre, they rapped. So they were in the spotlight because they were also um, vocalists. Nowadays, especially because of the EDM influence and how EDM and hip hop are pretty much intermixed, <clears throat> you see an emergence of, the producer, which is ironic because I think still to a pretty high degree, the paradigm still puts the producer or the songwriter at the bottom of the totem pole. Um, but you're seeing some standout producers. I mean, you, you know, uh, like a DJ snake or, um, a Mike will who become figure public figures and they've now transcended uh, the just, I guess the, 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 the different 
subcategories of music because there's a producer community and you know we're interested in in who whichever producer came out with the with the craziest beat but the average consumer may not be interested in that but now the average con consumer knows who a dj snake is and knows who uh mike will is and is always talking about oh i can't wait for the beat to drop you know that type of thing so it's starting to become popular now production is starting to become a little more uh demystified a little more mainstream and it's a good opportunity to be a producer right now so do you think it's become easier to become a producer nowadays or is it's become easier to do anything nowadays just because of the advancements in technology but i think it's i think people are now more familiar with what a producer does mm -hmm. more so than they were maybe 10 20 years ago and so that's that affords producers more opportunities to reach more people because they're just more receptive to it. Okay. So yeah, a lot of uh, a lot of our members have this debate about producer versus beat maker. And do you do you see like a difference between them? And what would yeah, you I don't I don't necessarily want to draw a line between a producer and a beat maker because I think at any given moment someone can make a beat and be done with the process, or somebody can. Uh, always learn to produce a whole record but uh for me i never saw a difference just because i was constantly working with recording artists and i rapped at one point so my whole thing was i wanted to see the whole song through and add you know the drops and record i hate recording and i don't i don't mix you know respect to all the engineers out there who know what they're doing i don't know what i'm doing um i'm just happy i can mix my own beats but Back then, when I didn't know any better, I was doing everything. And, and so as a result of that and working always within groups, it wasn't just this antisocial process of me sitting alone and making beats all day. Um, I learned how to produce a record, you know, and, and producing a record is way, 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 way beyond the, what, um, what the process of, of making a beat is, you know, it's... Yeah. It, it's vocal production it's um working with with the vocalists really uh in depth and working with an engineer and just making sure the record is the best it can be and then also using your own vision and experience to add um to the record after the beat is already made okay cool so uh, yeah, you, so you recently expressed some uh, quite strong opinions about producers giving away uh, free beats. Mm -hmm. uh, every day I hear about the frustrations that producers have when they're constantly coming across artists who are interested in free beats, who are only interested in free beats. So for producers starting out, that can be like a deal breaker, that can feel like a dead end in their career. So how do you deal with uh, artists asking you for free beats? And what, would you, what advice would you give to other producers? Well, if an artist asks me for free beats, I just ignore them, but as as far as that video goes um and it, it got a lot of traction i i knew it would you know i don't i tend not to post too many controversial videos but i was in a situation that inspired that rant and i guess people like rants because it reached over a hundred thousand people just on facebook alone so that conversation as we speak right now is, is still going on and um i just want to be clear you know i think a lot of people misunderstood the video it wasn't a matter of me having a problem with producers giving beats away and not receiving uh, money in exchange for those beats. It was, it was my frustration with the culture right now of, of music and the expectation that, that uh, a beat is, um, I guess, not an essential. It's treated as, as non-essential. And part of that is because producers, unfortunately, have and there are so many of us and a lot of us haven't understood how to control our careers and even what our options are. You know, a lot of producers don't know about publishing rights. A lot of producers don't know about income streams. A lot of producers don't know about licensing. A lot of producers have no idea what a contract even looks like. Um, and so people will take advantage of that. and. The expectation is now, you know, you, you, it's so easy to get beats and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but 
because the expectation is that you can just go online and, and get whatever beat, you know, you can rip a beat off of YouTube, even if it's not meant to be used for free, rappers still have access to it. So you combine that with, with, with the unfortunate fact that a lot of producers don't know how to navigate the world of, of music business and you have a pretty toxic environment. And so that's what I'm really commenting on. I just want producers to understand their worth. And the second a producer understands his or her worth and his or, his or her value and, and power when it comes to creating music, then that person will necessarily want to learn more and, and um, just increase their, their knowledge of ways they can fully uh, grow themselves as professionals. So do you you think there should be uh, more education in like the entire process rather than just making the beats? It's also, uh, you know, how to connect with artists and how to sell, how to sell the music and obviously the licensing and the contracts and things like that. So you think there should be more education on on the entire process? More, more um, self-education. I think we should just, if we care about what we do and we do, we we all love music, then we kind of owe it to ourselves to just seek that information out. And, um, you know, we live in the information age, you know, and it was, was so crazy to me. And so ironic is that it seems as though the more resources are available to us via the internet, the less likely we are to seek them out. Um, I mean, I get, I get inbox messages and I've stopped checking my inbox because of this. I, I get the craziest inbox messages. Hey, uh, Tell me about copyright. No, go to copyright.gov. Is Google it. Hey, uh, my sound card isn't working. Read the manual. You, you know what I mean? There are all these. You get questions like, about people's sound card not working. You're really waiting for, for me. I'm one person. I get a million of these messages every day. You're really waiting for me to tell you <laughs> your, the answer that you seek when you could have just as easily went out and, and, and looked for it yourself. I, that's, that's a mentality that I don't understand. So. When I, when I put the videos and stuff like that, I'm constantly saying, verify this information, go out, here are some links, explore, read, figure it out, um, get in the habit of learning, get in the habit of seeking information because that's, that's going to be something that's going to benefit you for the rest of your life. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's pretty crazy that people come to you for questions like that. I mean, when everything's just so readily available, um, yeah, it's pretty crazy. Um, so yeah, my next question is: there's, there's, there's like tons of marketing methods out there that producers use to promote their beats. Uh, what would you say is your most powerful method to connect with artists to work with? Um, my most powerful method is just getting music out um, and and working on uh, good projects. Honestly, uh, do you do aside- you know, online promotion or anything? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I kind of live on social media, um, so I keep my social media up. But a lot of that stuff is that 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 caters to the producer community. Um, so I, I say my core base of of supporters are producers. Um, so they're not trying to buy beats for me. Yeah, I don't think they are. That'd be kind of weird. Uh, so in order to market myself to artists who are, are interested in buying beats is, is usually someone hears about me from um, checking out a record that I produce, you know, it's, or uh, my instrumental albums, you know, every time I get to a point where I have a whole bunch of popular records or semi-popular records that have been published, then that's when I prepare another instrumental uh, project and release that. And then I have all my contact information and, you know, it's, hey, you like this beat that I produced for Kevin Gates? Cool. Contact me. Okay. And, and that, that seems to work pretty well. Yeah, so, I mean, even now, as a platinum producer, you still work with independent and unsigned artists. So how, how do you think it differs to working with major artists? Uh, less paperwork. Yeah. Less paperwork, less money, but um, if, if I, I love working with with unsigned artists I mean that's that's really most of what I do is is working with unsigned artists mm-hmm. okay so, uh, you, as far as, sorry, Karen. well I mean there are, there are some obvious differences most unsigned artists don't have marketing budgets 
or if they do, they're not at the at the level of you know a Def Jam artist or an Atlanta artist, Atlantic Records artist. So there's there's that, but uh, I mean the process is is pretty much the same. I mean the, you, I think you have more options working with an unsigned artist because you can lease beats, you can you know negotiate directly with the person, and, and you can't always do that when you work with a major label artist. You're rarely working. Well, really, you're never working with the artist. I mean, the artist isn't even working with me. They're they're talking to a manager, or a lawyer, who's talking to a manager, or a lawyer, and then someone from the label contacts you. And you know, once you get used to it, you get used to it. Like the the Gunplay record that um, just came out, that was through Def Jam, and so I was already in the system. So it was a really easy process. Um, and so I, I had worked with the with the Def Jam legal people before and so it just it was cool okay cool so i just want to wrap things up uh, i just uh, I, I noticed that you offer a lot of products and services on your website djpain1.info um can you talk a little bit more about that yeah the website just kind of <laughs> consolidates everything so i post my music my albums which are all free downloads and a lot of tutorial videos and a whole bunch of free content as far as uh, resources for producers go. So uh, a lot of drum kits, a lot of sample packs, uh, construction kits, just a lot of stuff. So if you're a producer, check that out, uh, djpain1.info, and you get links to all my social media, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, everything from, from that website. Cool, fantastic. All right, brilliant. Well, that wraps up the interview. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, and, uh, well, I hope you have a good day. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you.